Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to speak about blotting techniques, which are widely used techniques um, in the biochemistry, proteomics, um, and even in uh, molecular biology. Uh, of course, in this video I'm going to speak about Western blotting. There are also other blotting techniques. So Western blotting is specifically used to detect proteins. Southern blotting is used to detect DNA and Northern blotting uh, to detect RNA. In this video I'm going to speak about Western blotting and there is another video uh, about Southern blotting and Northern blotting. So let's start speaking about a Western blotting technique. Uh, of course, Western blotting is a technique used to detect proteins. So it's used to detect a specific protein in a protein mixture. Let's say that I, that I have a protein extract from a cell, a prokaryotic cell or an eukaryotic cell, whatever, and I have a protein mixture. And I'm interested in the, uh, to detect uh, a specific protein in this mixture. What I have to do is to use Western blot. The thing is that the first step in Western blotting is SDS page. So, um, by the way, there is a video in my channel taking, talking about SDS page. So if you didn't watch it, I highly recommend you to go uh, watch the other video about SDS page and then come back because it will be much easier to understand Western blotting if you uh, understand SDS page. So first of all, to detect a specific protein in a protein mixture, we should separate the proteins using SDS page. So let's say that this is uh, the gel of SDS page. We said we have uh, the stacking gel and the separating gel. We uh, apply this uh, sample, which is our sample, the protein extract. In the, well, in the wells uh, we see in the gel, and then we apply an electrical current using a battery or a power source. So we apply an, an electrical current, and then the proteins will migrate from negative toward positive charge because they are uh, negatively charged, the proteins. So they, they will migrate to the positive charge, and then they will be separated in the gel according to their molecular weight. This is general, generally speaking about SDS page. So the thing is that what if I have several uh, samples? Uh, so this is like a, the proteins uh, will be separated uh, according to their molecular weight. So what if I have several samples and then I get something like this? But what if I am um, interested in detecting specific protein? Let's say my pro the protein of my interest is a 45 uh, kilo dalton, this one. So as, you, uh, as you're seeing here, this protein doesn't exist in all the samples. And also it exists like in this sample more than other samples. So I am interested in detecting this protein. Let's, let's be more realistic. Let's see how did this gel looks um, in reality. It looks like this. So if I have an SDS page, which, which looks like this, because in each sample, I might have like hundreds of proteins because the, the sample is extracted from a cell. So if I get a cell and extract the proteins from it, I will get a, like a sample of, or a mixture of hundreds of proteins. The thing is that I'm interested in one of these proteins, so it will be impossible to see this uh, protein on the gel. What I do is to apply as, uh, Western blotting. And to apply Western blotting, I should have a specific antibody uh, with a specific binding site to the protein of my interest. So saying that this is the protein of my interest, and this is like an epitope or a binding site of, of the protein, I should design an antibody which has a binding site that can specifically bind to my protein. So the thing is that if I have this uh, antibody, then this antibody, it, let's say I have this uh, the gel and my protein is inside the gel. So if I take a, a side look to the gel, the gel looks like this. So the proteins are inside the gel. And so the antibody cannot bind to the protein when the protein is inside the gel. So what I have to do first is to transfer the proteins to a surface where the, where the antibody can uh, detect and bind the protein of my interest. And this is the first step of Western blotting. So the first step of Western blotting is transfer, in which I transfer the proteins to a membrane 
And this membrane might be uh, nitrocellulose, PVDF, or other nylon membrane, uh, which has an affinity to the proteins. So the proteins combine on, on the surface of this membrane. Where I do it that I put this membrane on a direct contact with the gel, like this. So now this is my membrane, this is the gel. Uh, then I cover this the gel and the uh, membrane with two filter paper like this let's see let's say that uh, the blue uh, layers are the fil filter papers and then i what i put is uh, like type of sponges so these are sponges and they are used to compress the sandwich so what i have here is a sandwich model and uh, it's compressed because what, I, uh, what I'm interested in is to keep this membrane in a direct contact with the gel. Then I put this, um, this sandwich, sandwich, let's say, in a plastic container. So here, we have, so here I have the filter paper, I have the gel, I have the membrane, I have the sponge, and then I put them all in a plastic container. Uh, and now I'm, I'm going to tell you why there is a black side and a red side. And then I put everything uh, like in a chamber. I fill this chamber with a buffer. And this buffer uh, is made of, which is called the transfer buffer. Buffer. Um, it's composed of three base, so the pH of uh, 8.3, uh, glycine. And methanol. Methanol is very specific and very important in the transfer buffer because the methanol is used to detach SDS molecules from the proteins and then to facilitate uh, the proteins binding to the membrane. You know from uh, from the previous video about SDS, you know that SDS molecules are bound to the proteins. So what I, what I want here is that the proteins I want to bind the proteins to the surface of the membrane. So if the protein is bound to SDS, this will uh, distract the protein binding to the membrane. And so the methanol is used to detach the SDS molecule and then to facilitate uh, the binding of the proteins to the membrane. So this is the transfer buffer. And then I apply uh, an electrical current using a battery or a power source. I apply a negative uh, charge uh, and a positive charge. So as, as you see here, the negative charge is always, always applied from the black side and the positive charge is applied from the red side. Why do I have a black side and the red side? It's uh, simply to differentiate because once my sandwich is inside the plastic, I cannot differentiate where is my gel and where is my membrane. So what I do is that I put the gel from the black side uh, on the black side and the membrane on the red side. So I apply the uh, negative charge on the gel side and the positive charge on the membrane side. So what's going to happen? Now I know that my proteins are negatively charged and then they will migrate in this direction from negative toward positive charge. So once the proteins are moving from negative to positive charge, they will reach the membrane and then they will bind on the surface of this membrane. So the thing is that if I apply a specific voltage on a specific time, I will end up with the, uh, having the proteins on the surface of the, of the membrane. The thing is that if I increase the voltage or the time applied, I will end up with finding my proteins uh, on the filter paper or on the sponges or even uh, in the buffer. Or even if I, for example, if I apply like less voltage or less time, I will end up seeing my proteins still in the gel. So I should be very careful applying the right voltage and the right time to transfer the proteins uh, for the right distance so they, they will be on the surface of the membrane. So here it is, this is the gel, you can imagine it this way, the proteins are separated according to their molecular weight, and then when the negative charge and the positive charge is applied, uh, the negative charge on the uh, gel side and the positive charge on the membrane side, the, the proteins will move in this direction, and then they will be transferred uh, 
on the membrane. So I will end up with the, having the membrane. This is the membrane, the nylon membrane, and the pro with the proteins bound on the surface of the membrane. So you can imagine it this way. From If I, I'm looking to it from a side look, let's say, this is the membrane, and this will be the protein with the binding side of the protein exposed uh, so the so when I apply the antibody, the antibody can detect the binding side of the of the protein and bind to it. The thing is that I cannot. So this this is the uh, antibody which will detect the protein and bind to it. The thing is that what I should do is the second step is block is blocking. Why? Because if I apply the antibodies directly to the membrane, the thing that's going to happen is that the antibodies are going to bind everywhere on the membrane because as I told you, this membrane has a high affinity to, pro to the proteins. So the proteins can bind on the membrane. And then if I apply the antibody directly, the antibody will bind everywhere on the membrane. So what I should do is that I should block the membrane. What we use for block to block the membrane is fat-free milk because the milk can bind everywhere on the membrane but not on the protein proteins and then the membrane will be blocked so here it is my blocked membrane i changed the color of the membrane because to, so i know that the membrane now is blocked and now we we're coming to the third step uh, the primary antibody the primary antibody um which as i told you before has a specific binding site to the protein of my interest. What I can do in this step is uh, is called membrane stripping. Some people do membrane stri stripping, some people don't do it. Membrane stripping is to cut the membrane, um, around, like to cut a piece of the membrane. Like this. for example, I'm interested in the protein which is 45 kilodalton, let's say. So I cut the membrane uh, to ha to have just the piece of my interest. Why? Because the primary antibody actually is so expensive. So if I cut the membrane, if I cut like the piece of the membrane which I'm interested in, then I will use less amount of the antibody because as, as I told you, it's very expensive. Also, if I apply the antibody to a smaller piece of the protein or to a specific piece of the protein, I, I would also reduce the chance of unspecific binding. Now, if I apply this primary antibody to the membrane, the primary antibody is going to uh, detect the protein and bind to it, as you are seeing here. Um, now, this primary antibody is protein specific, so it's very specific to this protein and it cannot bind to any other protein but this one. How do, we, how do people produce this antibody? Of, of course, these antibodies are um, commercial, commercialized, so you can buy them. Uh, they are produced in animals, in they might be produced in mice, in monkeys, uh, rats, and or any other animal. So what what how they are produced? Um, we can take uh, like a, we can take uh, an extract of this protein and inject it in the mouse, and then let the mouse produce an antibody which is specific to this protein, and then we extract the uh, primary antibody from the mouse, or from the rat, or from the rabbit, or whatever. So what I have. Uh, the, as, an, uh, as a primary antibody is like this. It's either mouse anti-human or rat anti-mouse or rabbit anti-human or whatever. So, it's, so this antibody is produced in mouse, for example, and it's anti-human. Or this antibody is produced... If I take... Uh, how, how do I produce mouse anti-human? If I take a human protein, if I take a, pr a protein from a human and I inject it into the mouse, then I take, as, then I will get an antibody from the mouse, but it works against human protein. So the primary antibodies are usually extracted from an animal, mouse, rat, rabbit, monkey, or whatever, and it's anti another species, so anti human, anti mouse, anti whatever. So the thing is that to the, now I have the primary antibody bound to the protein. But the thing is that now I have to detect the antibody. 
Why? Because the antibody is not coupled with any fluorescent or any other uh, molecule. Because the, as I told you, the primary antibody is so expensive. So if I, and the primary antibody is so specific for a certain protein. So if I want to uh, couple every specific antibody with an a fluorescent, it will be extremely expensive. What I do is that I apply something called secondary antibody. The secondary antibody is uh, coupled with a fluorescent or with a chemiluminescent uh, molecule. I'm going to speak about the, about the detection. And it's anti-species or species specific. What does that mean? So this antibody can, it's not a protein specific. It doesn't have like a specific uh, binding site to a specific protein, but in, it can bind, for example, to every protein extracted from the mouse or every protein extracted from the rat. So it's spe species specific. So we say it's anti-human, anti-mouse, anti-whatever. Okay. So what I do here is that I apply, so now I have, let's say I have a protein extract from human. So all the proteins I have on my membrane are human proteins. And then the, let's say that the antibody is extracted from the mouse. So I have mouse anti-human. For this, I choose the anti-mouse uh, secondary antibody and I apply it on the membrane. This secondary antibody is going to detect the primary antibody because, because every other protein on the membrane is a human protein, but the antibody, this antibody is extracted from the mouse, and this uh, secondary antibody is anti-mouse, so it will detect the mouse proteins and bind to it, and then I can detect the signal coming from the secondary protein. How can I detect the secondary antibody? Secondary antibody can be coupled either with a fluorescent that can uh, like give a signal uh, under a, a specific wavelength or with something called the chemoluminescent. Chemoluminescent is a substrate of a certain enzyme. This substrate uh, will be coupled with the uh, secondary antibody and then I can apply the enzyme of this substrate which will um, uh, produce a reaction that is going to give a signal and I can then detect the signal in a, a dark chamber. The signal, uh, of, the signal uh, I get from the secondary antibody uh, looks like this. Of course the intensity of the signal coming out of the uh, protein uh, determines the amount of the protein in this sample. So here I have several samples so um, uh, the more signal I have from the protein, I know that, that I have more protein in this sample. Why? Because when I have a higher amount of the protein in this sample, then more antibody will bind to the proteins and then more secondary antibody will be bound and then I will get more signal. While here I have a, like very little amount of the protein, so the antibody cannot bind to these uh, proteins so much because uh, I have a little amount and then I will get um, a low signal. So if I have several samples, I can say, yes, in these samples, I have a high amount of the protein of my interest. Uh, in this sample, I don't have any, or I have traces of the protein. In this uh, sample, I have a little bit of the protein. This is everything I wanted to tell you about uh, Western blood. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed it, if you enjoyed it like, share, share with your friends, uh, subscribe to the channel. There are many other interesting videos uh, in the channel. You can also write any suggestion for other vi for other videos in the comments. You can also ask any question you want in the comments. I will answer you and see you in the next video. Bye.